So you know. Okay, so we've been looking at linear block codes and various things. I want to remind you of the number of things that you should know. Okay, the first thing you should know is you should be very very comfortable with in linear codes is are these two matrices G and H. Okay, you should be com very comfortable with what their dimensions are, what what their rank should be, what's the relationship between all these quantities, right? There's so many things that you should be very very comfortable with. What's the row space of G? What's the columns? Sp column space will typically never enter the picture. The row space of G. The row space of H will be the dual. All those things should be very, very comfortable with. And you should be able to go back and forth from one to the other, okay, using the systematic uh, reduction. You can you can go from one to the other very, very easily. Okay. The next thing you should be very, very comfortable with is this quantity d, okay, which is the minimum distance. Okay. You should know its definition very clearly for linear codes, particularly, right? Then the relationship between d and H is very, very crucial. Okay, so this is what is usually used in, in practice and design and every other version. Okay, so what's the connection between this quantity, minimum distance, and the parity check matrix H? What is the connection? Minimum number of linearly dependent columns. Okay, and you should contrast that with the rank, which is a completely different kind of entity. Okay, and they <coughs> they do have a relationship as I said, but it's it's not the same. Okay, so those two things. And next thing is syndrome decoder. Okay, what is the syndrome decoder? It is the maximum likelihood decoder for linear codes over the binary symmetric channel, right? That's one of the crucial properties. And how do you go about actually implementing a syndrome decoder, right? So what what would you what would you do? What's the important equation to solve in the syndrome decoder? S equals H times E transpose, right? How do you find S, the syndrome? H times R transpose, right? And then you find E. What what's the characterization for E? There's a further solution, further uh, importance given to the type of solution you need. Okay. Yes. Minimum weight. Okay. You do that, you're doing the optimal thing. Okay. As I said, it's very complex, but but still, that's the idea. Okay. All right. So I I want to just close out with the syndrome decoder with one final example. We'll just pick a code and then go through the syndrome decoder once again, just to remind you. And then I'll do a final calculation, a simple calculation to show how to find probability of block error. And then we'll put a rest to it, and then we'll move ahead. Okay. So this is the final example I'm going to do, just to brush your keep up keep you up to speed and what we've been doing in the past class was modifying codes right that's what we've been doing i'll get back to that soon enough but i want to quickly do an example just to drive home the point once again okay i'll pick my standard i don't know i might have done this several times before but several times already but uh, this is a good example to oops i'm sorry This is a good example to drive home the point. Okay, just to illustrate what is going to happen. Okay, so if you were to build a syndrome decoder for this, you'll be trying to solve this equation: S equals H times E transpose. Okay, so you could solve this equation for each S. How many different S's do you have? It's a three-bit vector, right? Okay, you have eight possibilities. As I said, you can do this ahead of time for these small cases and build a table. Okay, you can call it the syndrome table if you want, which would have S on one column and then what? E cap on the other column. Okay, so you can do this. So let me write down all the possible syndromes. There's no reason to write it in this order. I just wrote it like that. Okay, you can write it in any order you want. For each syndrome, you can easily solve for E cap, right? What's the solution? The minimum weight solution, which will give you this syndrome. By inspection, one can very, very easily solve. Okay, I'm going to quickly do it. Ah, got the ordering. Okay, what about for 111? There are several possibilities, right? So I have to pick one. I'll pick this one possibility. Okay, so these are my E cap. Okay, 
So to do the optimal thing over the binary symmetric channel, optimal decoder over the binary symmetric channel, what should I do? Whenever I get a received vector r, I have to compute s, okay, h times r transpose, which will give me s, and then look up e cap, okay, and then you output r plus e cap as your c cap, okay. This would be the optimal decoder over a binary symmetric channel. What will be the probability of error of error which is what c cap not equal to c for this decoder? I'm sorry. Okay, so I'm sorry. Yeah, so th that's the key point to note. If you keep thinking in terms of C, you'll keep running around in circles. It's not very easy to figure out. But you immediately jump to E. Okay, so if you say, see, these are the error error vectors E cap that I'm going to output. If the actual error that happened was not equal to any of these E caps, then I will definitely make an error, right? Do you see why? Right? The actual error that happened could have been E. If I decide E cap was my error and if E is not equal to E cap, I will make an error. And that is a very easy thing to calculate. So the only thing you have to calculate is what? This is the same as the probability that the actual error that occurred is not equal to one of these E caps. Okay? So this can be very easily calculated. Okay? So the another way of calculating it is 1 minus probability that the error vector equals, uh, let me say, let me be very clear, e cap from list, okay, from table, okay, this is 1 minus probability that e equals e cap from table, okay, so these are, these e caps in the table can be called the correctable error vectors, or correctable errors if you want, right. You see that those are the only correctable errors according to my syndrome decoder. Okay, there could be there could be some change possible here. Okay, you can you can alter this if you want to and still remain optimal. But <coughs> these are the only error vectors that are correctable. For instance, if I introduce an error in the first bit and the last bit and run this decoder, will I be able to correct it? Not with this decoder. No. Okay. What will happen if the actual error vector that happened? Okay. For instance, if e equals 1 0 0 0 0 1 what is e cap certainly not e but what will it be can you calculate that yeah so you can easily find out right how do you find out you simply go and find the syndrome how can i find s if given e i'm not given r no how can i find s i said s should be calculated as h times r transpose yeah so you know h times r transpose is the same as h times e transpose nobody will give you e in the reality okay i'm just giving you this just to show in an example okay so you calculate that, you see the syndrome is what? 100. Zero, zero. You go here, look it up. You are concluding that there was an error in the fourth position. Well, the error was something else. Okay, so you conclude the E cap is 000, zero, zero, one, zero, zero. Okay, so this is how uh, and you make an error. Okay, so this is a simple example to see how you make an error. Okay, so how do you compute this quantity probability that E equals E cap from table? It's very, very easy. Okay, just simply find the probability for each each vector here. What is the probability of this vector? What is the probability that E equals this E cap? 1 minus P to the power 6. Okay? So likewise, you can find each of these cases. For instance, if you want to find the probability here, what is this? P times 1 minus P to the power 6. I gave you this formula, right? It is actually P times the weight of E. Oh, 5. You are right. Okay? P times P to the power weight of E. 1 minus P to the power n minus weight of e. This is a very simple formula. Okay, so you can use this and quickly compute this this probability. Okay, so in this case, what will the answer be? What will the final answer be? What will be the final answer here? If you go through this computation, what will be probability that c hat not equal to c? What will this be? Right, 1 minus, you will have this term, 1 minus p to the power 6, then what? 6 times p 
p times 1 minus p to the power 5. Do you agree? And then you would have p square, p square 1 minus p to the power 4. Okay, so that is the exact expression. If you want, you can compute that. Okay, I know I wrote that down at the very end, but it is just a simple application in this case. All right, so that's I'll sign off with the, of the on the syndrome decoder at that point. We're not going to go back to that again. Maybe in your examples or your assignments that you see, we might see more of this. Okay, so I'll urge you to do it. A slightly non-trivial calculation is finding bit errors. Okay, bit error probability. See, this the previous probability I calculated was probability that C cap is not equal to C, not one bit of C cap not equal to one bit of C. Yeah, it's a more difficult calculation. So there's no point in doing it also. Okay, you know, if one goes to zero, the other will also go to zero. Okay, maybe in a different way, but it will also go to zero. Okay, so let's go back to what we've been doing. So, okay, the last thing we saw was operations on codes. Okay, so we saw two things. What What are the two things we saw? One, one thing I introduced initially as a very important tool for designing codes for d equals 4. What was that? Extension, right? So, what do you do for extension? <coughs> extension is what? How do you extend a code? You add an overall parity, right? So, it is very easy to see why if d equals 3, if you extend, you will actually get a code with d equals 4. Okay, So, that is a simple design you can do for d equals 4. Okay, So, extension is add an overall parity. Okay, the other thing I saw was what? Puncturing. I saw puncturing. I described puncturing. Okay, we saw puncturing as the next uh, next stop. What do we do in when you puncture? How do you describe it in words? You drop some bits. In more, if you want to be very specific, you say you drop some parity bits. Okay, it's useful to write down a few things. What happens to the rate when you extend? Does it decrease or increase? Decreases. Okay. So, for instance, one might think of extending as something that decreases rate. What is the benefit that you could potentially get? You could have an increase in minimum distance. Okay. So, it's not. It's not a. It's in some cases, if it's odd, it will increase. Here, what happens? The rate. Rate definitely increases if you drop parities. Okay, just make sure you drop parities. In most cases, rate will increase. And minimum distance, what will happen to that? Yeah, it will decrease. It's likely to decrease also. Okay, so it could stay the same, but in most cases, it will decrease. Okay, so those are the uh, those are the things to keep in mind. So, so puncturing is used a lot in practice. Okay, so the reason is you don't want to keep designing a different code for different rates, and in real life. You will always need multiple rates for your codes. Okay, so for instance, if you think of the famous wireless situation, there's something called fading and all these other things, which makes your instantaneous signal to noise ratio vary over time. Okay, so you might have different signal levels, or if you think in terms of binary symmetric channel, in practice you might have a different P for for different time. Okay, and you and you will hardly ever find one code fitting all P's. Okay. So what you do is, and it's also expensive to keep designing different codes. So what you do is, you design a big code of very low rate, so that it'll meet the worst condition, and then you keep puncturing to get higher rate codes for better conditions. Okay, so that's a very useful trick in practice. It's used a lot in practice. Puncturing is a very very common technique. Another thing that's very common in practice is what's called shortening, which I'll describe more. Okay, shortening is also very easy to describe. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do. Okay, so suppose I have a code C. Let me start with an NKD code C. Okay, I guess described by generator matrix G and parity matrix, parity check matrix H. Okay, so how do I form a code word? Code word is formed as M0, M1, MK minus 1 multiplied by G. Okay, so <coughs> okay, so I'll assume G is in systematic form. Okay, okay, I'll assume G is in systematic form. So if I do that, then my code word is going to be M0, M1, MK minus 1, and then I would have what? I would have parity bits here. Okay, so how do I describe this parity bits? I'll simply write it as M times P. Okay, so what is P now? 
I will take G to be in I P form. Okay, M is multiplying P. Okay, so I will begin by, by giving a simplest example of shortening. It is a more general thing. So, when you shorten the shortened code will actually have dimension in, in the block length n minus s and dimension k minus s okay so maybe i'll call it cs okay the code words will be okay for the shortened code the code words are obtained by as m0 m1 okay so it may be k minus s minus 1 okay so the first k minus s bits will be bits of the message the remaining s bits i will set to 0 okay remaining s bits are message so when i shorten that's what i do last s bits are set to 0 Okay, I have chosen last s just for ease of description. Okay, you can choose any s of the message bits and set them to zero. Okay, I'm going to set the last s because that's because I can get this nice description. But if you want something else, you can change that also. Of course, if they are set to zero in my code word, I don't have to transmit them. Okay, so I won't transmit them. Okay, I'll begin by transmitting parities. Okay, you see that? Okay, so how do I compute the parities now? I'll simply add the zeros. Okay, so I'll say m times p. I will keep the parity computation same. And what is m? m is m0 to m k minus s minus 1. And then what will I do? I will add enough zeros to get my get my remainder length k. Okay. I will simply send those parities. Okay. Is that clear? Okay, so shortening is your shortening. You have to think of it as shortening the message. Okay, since since you're thinking of always a systematic version, if you shorten the message, you'll also be shortening the code word. Okay, if you pick s best bits of your message and set them to zero, those corresponding s bits in the code word also become zero, right? So that's what happens in the shorten. Is this clear? What's happening? Okay. All right. So. So it's the parameters are clear, right? N minus S is very clear. The S, S things I dropped, I made them zero. K minus S is also clear. Is it clear? Is K minus S clear? Yeah, it has to be. Okay. So if you want to think about it more carefully, let's start with the generator matrix G. Okay. So let's start with the generator matrix G, which was I K and then P, right? What am I doing to the generator matrix when I shorten? In my message, the last s bits are becoming zero. So the last s rows can be what? S rows are what? Are not involved in any code word. So I might as well drop them. Okay. So I can have to only retain the k minus s rows. But in the identity matrix, if I chop off the last s rows, what will happen to those last s columns in the identity matrix? It'll also become zero. That's what that's what it means when I say the code words are going to be zero. I can drop that also. So I might as well drop those columns. So if I start with this, the last s rows are removed, and likewise, s columns are also removed. S columns become zero. Okay, is that clear? Okay, so you get the generator matrix of the shortened form, which will be i k minus s okay and then p i'll say 1 to k minus s alone okay you don't take the entire p you only take the first k minus s rows of p okay so you just simply chop it out okay you just drop this you go from here to is that clear that's how you do to what that's what you do to the generator matrix so it's very clear why this why this generator matrix also has dimension k minus s right the rank is k minus s so it's n minus s k minus s what about minimum distance it's a little bit more tricky let me see yeah so minimum distance 
will be low bounded by d okay minimum distance of the shortened code will be greater than or equal to d okay why why will it be greater than or equal to d why, how can i say it will be at least d yeah exactly right so i'm not i'm not changing any of the code words each code word of the shortened code with zeros inserted will become a code word of the original code do you see that so of course if you had a certain minimum distance for the original code and if you only remove zeros from the code words the weight is not going to change so you'll still get the same at least the same minimum distance can you get more yeah so it depends on where i remove no so you you can get more it's possible to get more okay so in fact one can argue many of the codes that we use are shortened versions of some other code the minimum distance increased okay so you could have minimum distance higher okay so if you want another way of thinking about it you can think of the parity check matrix what is the parity check matrix okay what will be the parity check matrix originally it's going to be n minus k by n and i'm going to have say p transpose here and then i n minus k okay what will be the parity check matrix for the shortened code it will remain n minus k right why and then you'll have n minus s here okay so the parity check part i will remain as such n minus k but in p transpose what will happen last s columns last s columns will become zero okay so and you can also see how how is it that you can can uh, how is it that you compute the code word using the parity check matrix right m k minus s minus 1 and then you are putting zeros here okay and then you calculate the parities right this is how you calculate right do you remember this is this is how you think about the code word in terms of the parity check matrix each bit of the code word is multiplying a column of the parity check matrix i have set the last s bits of the message to zero which means the last s columns in p transpose are completely irrelevant for me okay so i'm going to chop that out and get this okay and i will remain the n minus k part will still remain the same okay so the crucial observation is d shortened is greater than or equal to the original d okay the reasoning is if we shorten code word if you add zeros to it you should get a code word of the original code and that has to be have distance at least d okay is that clear <coughs> okay so that's the last bit i want to say i also want to say shortening is very very useful okay uh, the main reason is uh, in practice when you construct some some good codes that we'll see later on some algebraic codes like reed solomon codes which are very useful in practice but they are they are very it's useful to think of them of uh, it's useful to construct them for a particular block length like 255 or 511 or 1023 so those are those block lengths these codes become very very interesting and nice to construct to encode and all that it becomes very simple to describe them mathematically is very easy at those block lengths okay but you may not always want those block lengths in practice okay right you you might want the same error correcting capability that these good codes give you but you don't want to compromise on your block length choice you, you don't want to you, you don't want that code to dictate your block length choice your block length might be limited by so many other factors in practice right so so you might want to shorten when you shorten what happens the minimum distance does not change in fact it can increase it won't increase in most cases it will be the same but what do you have control over over block length okay what about rate what happens to rate yeah what will happen to k minus s by n minus s compared to k by n do a simple computation and tell me in what case will it decrease and what case will it increase you are using k is less than n you have to use that so k less than n it will what will happen will it decrease or increase please confused do the computation <laughs> it will decrease okay so rate will go down okay any time minimum distance can increase rate will have to go down okay that has to happen but if k is greater than n then it can increase you know am i right or wrong yeah so okay anyway so 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 finally one can share for shortening uh rate will decrease okay yes we had a question yes 
can increase it's possible yeah, so yeah so think of for instance i can give you a simple example okay it's a very very silly example just to drive home the point suppose my g is this and i shorten the last bit what will happen right you see my example right if i shorten the last bit my code suddenly has minimum distance 4 okay so think in terms of some non systematic cases to get the right picture if you want a systematic example also it's possible you can you can come up with a systematic example also okay all right so that's uh, that's where we'll stop as far as shortening is concerned let's keep moving ahead the next little bit i want to do before we go ahead and look at designs for d equals 5 right is first actually maybe we'll see an example for doing d equals 4 design okay just for just for fun it's, it's, we know how to do it right how do you do it how do you do d equals 4 extend design d, d equals 3 and then extend okay so let's let's try it okay so let's try an example for d equals 4 i want you to construct a code which will have these two properties okay so of course what should you do to k maximize k right so or minimize the number of rows you would put in the parity check matrix okay go ahead and try that okay we'll try this first and then we'll see some nice bounds that relate n k and d okay so one can expect that and we'll show you how that works so what code will you first try to design 30 block length also will go down by one right so remember that so block length 30 the minimum distance 3 code you have to try to design and then extend it to get block length 31 minimum distance 4 i have put greater than or equal to 4 but try d equals 4 okay don't give me the 31 1 31 <laughs> repetition code and say <laughs> i have finished my i want you to maximize k okay so and to k should not be 1 not enough of you should be done by now so how do you how do you think about this okay so first you have to look at let me say n prime equals 30 d equals 3 what's the minimum number of rows you need in h for n prime 30 and then minimum distance 3 how many rows do i need for minimum distance 3 5 right you can't do it with less than 5 right right don't see enough people nodding their head and with belief you know you're just generally nodding your head are you convinced you need five right you can't do it with four right if you have four there are only 16 15 different possibilities and you have to repeat you can't do anything more to it okay so you need five columns here okay? and there are various ways of doing it okay and then you extend it maybe this is h prime you extend it what do you do put all ones row and then put zeros on top you'll get the 31 so this 31 will be what k equals what so you have a 30 25 3 code right you extend to get to get what 31 25 4 code okay so that's what in fact most of these you might say how do i know it just really absolutely maximizes k maybe there is some other magical construction that will not do it uh, i mean it's it, it one has to prove such things okay so the best way of proving it is people maintain a table okay, is a person called NJ Sloan who maintains a table of what's the maximum k possible for a given n and given d okay I believe for 31 and 4 it will be 25 okay I think so I think it is 25 somebody might want to check that okay so you can go ahead and check that people have worked on it and figured out that this is the best possible k. that requires some proof okay 
So the next thing we are going to take up is a couple of techniques to look at relationships between n, k and d. Okay. Okay. Obviously they are interrelated, right? One can easily see that, right? D, d measures how far away two vectors are. Okay. So think in again, think in terms of the geometry view, right? Visualize that, right? Your stars are the code words and they have to be at least so many so much distance apart means those spheres around the stars should not overlap okay all these spheres you have to place in this big geometry and then they should not overlap so there is a nice bound so if you keep increasing your t which is your error correcting capability the number of code words has to go down right you cannot keep generally putting as many code words as you want and insist on a very large t okay so we'll use those ideas to come up with some simple bounds on n k and d okay and we'll see where we go and we'll see how good this code is first. Okay, so we'll see that. Okay, some bounds. The first bound I'll do is called the Hamming bound or the sphere packing bound. We'll call it the Hamming bound. Okay, so it's based on this, this sphere idea. Okay, so you take this NK code. Okay, these are your, this is 0, 1, n okay all your code words all your vectors are here i'm sorry okay and then you have your code words then you have your code words yeah so you draw a sphere of radius t around each code word yeah t i'll say t okay so these stars are your what code words of of a NKD code. Okay. How many stars will I have? 2 power k, right? How many vectors will there be in each sphere? Inside each sphere. Okay. Radius is radius is t which is floor of d minus 1 by 2. Okay. How many vectors will I have in each sphere? The code word will be there, right? And then what else will be there? Vectors that are a distant one away from the code word, right? They will be there. So how many of them are do we have? NC1. NC1. Do you see that? You'll have NC1 vectors that are a distance one away from the code word, right? We did this computation once before. Okay, I want you to remind. I want to remind you of that. What else will be there? Code words that are a distant two away. Okay, till what do you have to go? NCT. Okay, and choose T. Okay, so it's, it's convenient to say and choose T. Okay, so, so that it's not confusing. Okay, so this is the number of vectors in each sphere. Okay, so that's the that's the first thing. Okay, so I'm going to write down the next two things, and then I want you to put an inequality in between those two. Okay, so I'm going to multiply this column, this entry by two power k. And I want you to compare this with what? 2 power n. Okay, what will happen? Do you see why there should be a less than or equal to? Because each of these spheres are non overlapping. Okay, so if you count the total number of vectors in each of the spheres and add them all up, you should get some number which is less than or equal to 2 power n. Okay, so there you go. That's the first bound on that relates n, k, and d. Okay. Okay. For n equals 31 and d equals 4, I want you to evaluate this and figure out how close we were with the previous construction. Suppose you take n equals 31, d equals 4. What is t for d equals 4? 1. Okay. So try to evaluate that and see if it, if the number we got satisfies this bound. It has to satisfy, right? And then we can see how close we are. Okay, so the bound people say will result in k less than or equal to 26. Okay, so we are pretty close, right? We got k equals 25. Okay, maybe 26 is possible. Okay, who knows? Okay. Is that all right? Okay, so this is how you use the bound. You know, I mean, you come up with some code 
So it's some D, then you can go back, use the bound, figure out what the bound tells you for the same parameters, and then see how close you are with your K. Okay? And then if you're close enough, you can feel happy about yourself, right? You've done something which is supposed to be very good. Okay, so this is how you should do most things in life, right? You should always try to design something, then come up with a bound to tell you how good it is, and then see how close you are to that, right? So that's something you have to do. Okay, so that's the first bound, Hamming bound. The next bound, which is also very easy, is the singleton bound. Okay, so I'm going to prove it using a combinatorial argument. Okay, so if you don't follow it, I'll try to keep up. There's also another simple linear algebra based rank argument, but I don't want to give it because it's a useful tool that I might introduce as well now. Okay, so we will use something called the pigeonhole principle. It sounds very fancy, but it's a very simple combinatorial rule. Okay, so we'll just use that. If you've not seen it before, it's a good thing to see. Okay, suppose somebody tells me I have an NKD code. Okay. What am I going to do? I'm going to write down all the code words of the code one below the other. Okay, so I'll write down all the code words of the code one below the other. So maybe I'll say my code words are C1, C2, 2. How many code words will I have? C, 2 power k. Okay, I'll write down C1 as say C10, C11 till C1, n minus 1. Okay, so likewise I'll write it down. Okay, so maybe this is C20, C21 c2 n minus 1 okay so seems like we are far away from a bound but we'll get there eventually okay c2 k 1 c2 power k n minus 1 okay so this seems like a very sm small list that i've written down it's actually a very large list okay so i've listed all the code words of my code all the bits one to each one to the other okay now <coughs> i want to look at i want to look at what the first k minus 1 positions. Okay, I've, I've chosen, look at that number I've chosen. I've chosen it very carefully. k minus 1 columns. Look at k minus 1 columns. Okay. Okay. How many code words do I have? 2 power k. How many possible k minus 1 bit vectors do I have? 2 power k minus 1. So what should happen in these k minus 1 columns? Uh, each one is repeated once. I don't know about each one repeating. There should be at least one repetition, right? That's called the pigeonhole principle. Okay. If you have 10 pigeonholes and if you have 11 letters to put in them, at least one hole must have two letters, right? Otherwise, it won't work. So likewise here, you have only 2 power k minus 1 possibilities in your first in for k minus 1 bits, right? But in the first, in the, but how many vectors do you have? 2 power k vectors. So there should be at least two vectors here which agree in the first k minus 1 positions. Okay. Do you see that? Okay. This will tell you 2 power k rows, but only what? 2 power k minus 1 vectors. That implies. There exist two vectors ci and cj, okay, agree in what? First k minus 1 positions, okay, there will exist i and j, i not equal to j such that ci and cj will agree in the first k minus 1 positions exactly. So what can be the distance between ci and cj? If they agree in the first k minus 1 positions, they could possibly disagree in the all the remaining how many? n minus k plus 1. So the minimum distance of the code should definitely be less than or equal to n minus k plus 1. Okay, so that is the that is the logic. Okay, d is less than or equal to the distance between c i and c j, which we saw just by the pigeonhole. Which will, which can be less, which has to be less than or equal to n minus k plus. Okay, we'll come to it slowly. Okay, so d is less than or equal to n minus k plus one. If you want to write it differently, you can bring k to this side and say k is less than or equal to n minus d plus one. Okay. 
okay so this bound is called the singleton bound it's a very famous bound codes that meet this bound are called mds maximum distance separable okay okay mds codes mds expands as maximum distance separable no meet this bound exactly achieve equality for this bound sorry mds code satisfy n equals i'm sorry i shouldn't write n equals d equals n minus k plus 1 okay so it's a very special bound it was studied a uh, lot and for instance the reed solomon codes meet this bound okay so it's very so one can construct them it's not like it's a very difficult bound to meet for instance codes that meet the hamming bound are called perfect codes i did not i did not uh, elaborate on that codes that meet the hamming bound are called perfect codes there are very few of them one can one can list out all the perfect codes also okay so here if you want some examples for instance the hamming codes meet the hamming bound okay the all the hamming codes will meet the hamming bound all right so here if you want examples for mds codes you can show what are these codes n1n what is the n1 code what is the only n1n code if you want an n1n code what is that repetition. the repetition code right that's the only code okay this will meet the mds bound okay this will satisfy the mds bound with the equality right calculate it if you want okay d equals n right n minus 1 plus n okay so this is mds Okay, what is the dual of this code? Okay, so the answer already came, but what's the dual of the repetition code? What are the what are the dimensions? N n. What will be this k for the dual? N minus one. What will be the minimum distance? How do you describe the dual of a repetition code? Okay, what's the dual? All vectors that satisfy. with dot product with the original code word should go to zero what's the only code word in the repetition code all ones so what will belong to the dual of the repetition code any code word which adds which has even parity right all the bits have to add to zero right even parity things okay so all vectors of even weight will belong to this code okay this is the dual of repetition code it's called the even weight code okay one can also check that this will be also mds in fact one can prove that in general if a code is mds its dual will also be mds seems like a surprising property one can prove it okay in fact one can also prove that there are no binary mds codes what does that mean these two are the only okay of course there's the other trivial N N one. What is the N N one code? It's the N N one code. Yeah, it's just the message itself. You don't add any parity, you get the N N one code. Okay, that's also M D S. Other than these three codes, there are no binary M D S codes. Okay, seems like a very difficult thing to prove, right? But one can prove it. Okay, it's not not too difficult also. Okay, there are no binary M D S codes. Okay, but you can, for instance, go through and check the. the code that we constructed what is the code that we constructed 31 25 4 right what is the mds for this you will get k is less than or equal to 28 but you know anyway k equals 28 is not achievable because i told you of that result right there no binary mds codes okay so k less than or equal to 27 is the only real bound here okay so this bound is probably not very tight okay so you can see it's not very very tight okay but this bound is important we'll come back and revisit that later okay so the last thing i want to do okay so now we have seen a couple of results these are bounds okay if you have an nkd code these two relationships have to be satisfied they cannot be violated okay the next result we'll show is kind of a positive result okay so it's, it's not something that has to be satisfied it's not a rule it's something that is possible we'll show we'll find nkd for which i can construct a nkd code i'll find a relationship between nk and d so that 
when three numbers satisfy those relationships i will always i can always construct a nkd code i won't tell you how to construct it but i know such an nkd code exists okay it's a positive result okay it's but it's still called a bound okay for some reason it's called a bound but don't get confused by it okay even if nkd don't satisfy that bound what can happen you, the code might exist it's only an existence result okay so you should remember that it's called the gilbert warshmaw bound it's a very very famous bound and the argument for constructing it is also very very easy very interesting okay like i said this is not really a bound it's only an existence result it's a bound on what are called very good codes okay so we won't worry about them but it's 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 only an existence result as far as we are concerned concerned okay so it starts by looking at how, how is it that we can construct a parity check matrix so that okay suppose i want an nkd code i want minimum distance t what should happen in terms of the parity check matrix d minus 1 or fewer columns should not add to 0 right in the binary case okay they should not be linearly dependent or they should not add to 0 okay so can i construct columns column after column after column making sure that that won't happen if you look at that very carefully you'll get the gilbert warshmaw bound okay it's it's shortened as the gv bound okay so let me let me try to see how that works out okay suppose i have r rows okay i fix the number of rows okay right suppose my target uh, target minimum distance is d okay by the way minimum distance is also called d min by many people okay so d, d min is minimum distance suppose i have r rows and my target minimum distance is d okay suppose by some magic i have constructed n minus 1 columns already added the bound is obtained by asking a question when can i add the nth column when can i add another column to this set of n minus 1 columns assuming that these n minus 1 columns already satisfy the this minimum distance criteria what is that no set of d minus 1 columns among these n minus 1 will add to 0 i already d minus 1 of fewer columns among these n minus 1 columns will add to 0 that i have already satisfied now how can i add the nth column if you ask that question when can an nth column be added added if you answer this question you will get the gv bound okay so i'm going to write it down and then we'll see how we argue it out okay so one column that i can never add is what the all zeros right so that is one that i can never add so i'll keep adding up i'll keep accounting for the columns that i cannot add okay and if that count happens to be less than what 2 power r then yeah then there is always a possibility that i can add a column you see that so that's my logic okay so i'll be adding given that i've added n minus 1 here already i'll make a count of number of columns that cannot be added that have been already eliminated by this okay so of course the all zero is eliminated and then what else all the n minus 1 columns by themselves they have been eliminated i can't add them then or I'm going to say I'm going to do an overcount here. Okay, I'm going to say n minus one choose two. Okay, and say these are the sum of any two chosen columns. Okay, okay, so these are this is the all zero column. Here, uh, each column. The next thing I should not do is I should not add the sum of two columns, right? I should not add. I, if I choose two columns from this n minus one and add them. That column should not be added. Okay, so I should include that here. But why am I saying if I put n minus one choose two here, it's an overcount? Maybe the way the minimum distance and all worked out, maybe there are repetitions, and maybe those repetitions are okay for me, right? For instance, if my minimum distance can be four, right? Two columns adding, two columns adding can be the same, right? And my minimum distance will not be violated. But I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of calculating all that. I'll simply say n minus one choose two. I'll avoid because I want just an existence result. I don't want a exact existence result or anything okay okay so keep that so sum of two columns but keep this point in mind this overcount is very important okay at the at the back at the root of this overcount lies one of the most uh, one of the most fascinating unsolved problems in coding theory okay so sum of two columns okay and then i'll keep doing this i'll say n minus one choose three okay so here you see how 
this can be suboptimal. I'll say sum of three columns I'll avoid, okay? But maybe sum of three columns here are equal to sum of three columns here, and my minimum distance is only six, and then I don't care, right? Right? So, so you keep that in mind. So, but I'll say that. Okay, this is scary. Okay, apparently I'm losing battery. Okay, so let me check. Oh my God. Okay, so looks like I'll have to save. So we'll suspend here. Oh my goodness. Oops. Okay, some very scary things are happening now. I thought I... Okay, stop.